What do you know of Greek myth? Perhaps images from MGM's 1981 epic Clash of the Titans streak across your mind in response to such a question. Images of Perseus weaving his way through Medusa's lair as Harryhausen's Gorgon hunts her prey in stop motion. Images of grandiose temples, rocky cliffs, and the sea, set to the soaring score by Lawrence Rosenthal and the London Symphony Orchestra. Maybe instead you think of the double-page spreads of Frank Miller's graphic novel, or the silver screen machismo of Zack Snyder's film at Counterpart. I remember seeing 300 a couple of times in theaters. I remember having fun with such a stylized rendition of the Battle of Thermopylae. Just a year prior, I had climbed the steps of the Parthenon on a summer tour of Athens. I had seen the source world firsthand, if but a few millennia removed. And then a couple of years later, alongside a small class of fellow undergrads, I navigated the stanzas of Homer's epic poem. It was my first contact with written myth. It reminded me of being a youngster enraptured by illustrations of sea monsters stricken by lightning bolts in the pages of rented library books. Maybe instead you've championed the reigns of another Spartan warrior, this one a bit more fictional than King Leonidas. Before God of War's dipping into Norse mythology in 2018, the bloodthirsty Kratos had a score to settle with the big baddie Ares himself. The original trilogy on PlayStation 2 and 3 had this cathartic base of kill-everything gameplay, while also being sneakily educational about those figureheads on Mount Olympus. What we know about Greek myth, then, is inconsistent. It is filtered through the media machine and diluted into the cultural milieu through films and comic books and literature and video games. My own anecdotes perhaps overlap with yours at certain junctures, but there seems to be no uniform experience with the source material. Nonetheless, even without knowing the origin stories in full, a modern audience can read the silhouette of the great messenger with his winged sandals and understand the connotation. Advertisements should also be included in that list of instructors, I suppose. To ask the question, what do you know of Greek myth, therefore, is to gauge these relationships we have with the past and invoke elementary images of gods and monsters in faraway lands. It is a question that lead designer Mark Rosewater posed to the room of fellow creatives in the earliest days of developing Magic's Riff on ancient Greece. As innocuous as it may seem, this question informed everything we see in the finished product. What do you know of Greek myth and its whiteboard of responses was the beginning of Theros and the retelling of the tales already told. Before coming to his team in Magic R&D to pitch Theros almost a decade ago, Mark Rosewater already had two seeds of inspiration sprouting in his mind. The first was a kid's book he picked up while scanning the library with his youngest daughter. He only remembered the subtitle, Gods, Heroes, and Monsters, but it served as the main point of reference to understand the most resonant qualities of Greek mythology. The second was a card from Future Sight, a somewhat unremarkable draft common. The type line made it special. Enchantment creatures were still a novel idea at the time and represented unexplored design space. Mark then hired the budding designer but still intern Ethan Fleischer as his strong second, and assigned him research. Ethan hit the books and then wrote his own. Classical mythology and Magic the Gathering became the go-to handbook for the team throughout design and development. It functioned as a glossary of the mythical monsters that already existed in the game, as well as a cachet of examples of the Greek stories that could easily be adapted into the color pie. Theros sought to repeat the successes of Innistrad as another magic world design from the top down. As opposed to bottom-up design, which starts with mechanics and then outfits them in a fantasy shell, top-down design uses flavor to inform new gameplay. Take this example from Born of the Gods, the second set in the original block. Impetuous Sun Chaser retells the story of Icarus. We can understand this from the illustration, of course, but the text box and power and toughness are top-down representations of the character's ambitious behavior. He's relatively weak, but must attack, including the first turn he's cast. This is momentarily advantageous, but once your opponent presents a flyer to block, it's likely that Icarus will overextend his abilities and cascade into the water below. The flavor text also explains his doomed hubris. This is what the first trip to Theros was all about. It started generally with three tropes, those of gods, heroes, and monsters, 
then became more and more concentrated and focused with each individual card design. References and allusions to popular Greek myths like that of Sisyphus who must endlessly push a boulder up a hill and watch it roll down once he arrives at the top are of course present, but the creative designers also wanted to reward those knowledgeable of the more obscure stories. A personal favorite was Hundred-Handed One, a type of Hecatonkeres, monsters with a hundred hands and fifty heads that helped Zeus and the Olympians overthrow the Titans. Ethan Fleischer designed this card, and of course he did. It's brilliant. But Theros was also content with mixing mythology and hardcore history. Annex and Cymede are King Leonidas and Gorgo, Queen of Sparta, respectively, two figures that very much lived and died in the real world. They exist in the same fantasy setting in which hydras are not beasts of far-off fiction, but tangible and immediate threats that could destroy them. The full range of historically accurate to completely imaginary is present in these cards, from the Sip of Hemlock which killed Socrates to the Colossus of Akros, an homage to the once-standing Colossus of Rhodes, a seven wonder of the ancient world. But this card is also a nod to another beloved sword and sandal epic, Jason and the Argonauts from 1963. Once Colossus of Akros becomes monstrous, it can attack, much like the giant statue of Talos that terrorizes Hercules and the crew on the Isle of Bronze in the film. It is a mashup of two entirely distinct references separated by hundreds of years in time. Once again, Theros primarily wanted to achieve full resonance with its core audience by allowing designers to have their own fun with the source material. This becomes more significant when returning to this world, but we'll get to that. The setting that these characters occupy is also a top-down design that blends the fiction and the real. Just before the release of the original Theros block came Return to Ravnica, which was an expansive, bottom-up design of an endless European cityscape. I did two deep dives on Ravnica for this series and made a point about its inversion of the concept of the basic land. Theros' basic lands are on the opposite side of the paradigm. They are idyllic representations of a bountiful pastoral countryside. I place great emphasis on basic land art because it provides a peek behind the scenes of world building. The reprinting of basic lands from a mechanical perspective is redundant at this point, and so their effective function is to communicate scale and setting and values and ideas that can otherwise be crowded in normal card illustrations. Essentially, they serve to show off a new world. The four artists who provided the original suite of basic lands for Theros are also worth mentioning for their grounded and realistic styles. The Theros we find on Rob Alexander's forest and Adam Paquette's mountain is not magical or overtly fantastic in any sense. They are vistas that can exist independently of the game world. Stephen Belladin's island is particularly effective at showing us a rock formation that looks fully Greek, and Raul Vitali's plains places us directly in the Mediterranean on a gentle and breezy evening as the sun sets in the distance. These cypress trees both allude to the myth and take me back to my time spent in the country. In this way, these basic lands also succeed in meeting our preconceptions about ancient Greece. They align with the picturesque and grand tour visions of the Mediterranean that filters through that media machine I referenced earlier. Theros is pastoral and elemental, and very much lines up cleanly with the original concept of the basic lands that Alpha built the game around. Theros is the living color pie. It is primordial, a world before technology and industry, a haven for nature to fully express itself. Look at the five original Theros monocolored gods. They are deities that are so cleanly divided between one another with no overlap in flavor or function. They are the manifestations of plains, islands, swamps, mountains, and forests, and they occupy these segregated landscapes which serve as their dominions. In complete contrast to Ravnica and its guilds, which blend together as a result of living in an overlapping city, the peoples and creatures of Theros are fully disconnected from one another. If you've ever spent time on a farm or tucked away in the mountains for a weekend, you'll know how peaceful it is to separate from the ongoings of daily urban life. There are spiritual advantages to living in the countryside, and Theros provides us a glimpse of that specific type of tranquility. The citizens and creatures in these dominions also mirror their gods' interests with the elements they embody. So many blue cards, for example, use water as a motif. They are all tied together by this one material of nature, the provincial substance of their god Thassa, Magic's Poseidon. Similarly, red cards are heavily composed with lava, the color's most essential connection to the god Perforos. Rarely is there crossover. White cards, for example, wield sunlight as a weapon, 
and never tap into the primal energies of the forest. That is Green's territory, and by extension, belongs to the god Nilea. This is what I mean when I say that Theros is the pastoral. I see affinities between this iteration of ancient Greece and the island of Catan, where hexagonal tiles represent distinct landscapes on an incongruent game board that also divides them by numbers on dice. The settlers of Catan, like the citizens of Akros and Miletus and Cetessa, are people of the earth. They build with raw materials and lean into the elements to survive. The salty air is probably crisp as it rolls in from the breezy sea. Life is good under the sun. But there is another element at play in Theros that I believe to be responsible for both the successes of the first block and the failures of the second visit. This is the pastiche, and to explain, I want to start with two cards. The first is Cyclops of One-Eyed Pass from Born of the Gods, and the second is Nyx-Born Brute from Theros Beyond Death. Both of these vanilla creatures utilize pastiche to great creative effect. The first Cyclops has text from the Theriad, which is Theros' version of the Iliad, and the excerpts we get from the other cards in the block provide a larger picture of the reference material. Nyxborn Brute quotes the Calafea, which is Theros' version of the Odyssey. Both snippets of flavor text refer back to Homer's epic poems and imitate their style and structure, if on a much smaller scale. They are a celebration of the ancient works, which have now been recontextualized into the game world. And alongside the Calafea, we also have Calafi, beloved of the sea. She is a pastiche of Odysseus himself. I've always been fond of cards like this because they bridge players from magic to the real world, and can be the catalyst for engaging in research. Some players may even read the Odyssey as a result of this kind of exposure, which is so rad in its own right. Stephen Belladin's The Acroan War is another example of pastiche done well in Theros. It's weaving together a few references into one piece. The card mechanics are a mini recreation of the Trojan War via the progression of a saga, the heroes in the painting mimic the aesthetics of black figure pottery found in Greece as early as the 7th century BCE, and the painting itself is emulating the textures of tapestries, which have been a method of art making since the Hellenistic era. This painting is a beautiful representation of top-down design, with its privileging of resonance over historicity, and its willingness to reimagine the past in the context of a fantasy world. And this same sort of exercise makes up the majority of the first block. Entire wiki pages are filled with the references to ancient Greece and how they've been remolded in Theros. Like I said prior, Theros was just aiming to meet the expectations that aligned with the subtitle from a kid's book. The cherry picking that ensued always meant that we'd never get a full or accurate representation of these stories. Violence, of course, is permissible, but the intense sexual content, for instance, has been scrubbed in the translations. And full blown errors have carried over as well. The entire concept of a kraken, for example, didn't originate in Greek myth. It was a Norse monster. But Maro and team argue that it has since become a staple to this genre. Clash of the Titans revolves around a kraken, so why can't Theros have one too? This is where pastiche enters into a gray area, where censorship and cultural inaccuracies become permissible in favor of striking resonant chords. So when we return to Theros in Theros Beyond Death, the kraken showed up again. But so did a bunch of other allusions, this time not specifically to ancient Greece, but to the first visit to the plane. It dawned on me while scanning the card image gallery that this set was much less an expansion of the first block, and much more a reiteration of it. It was a pastiche of a pastiche. Of course, this is the kind of risk you run with returning to a world designed top down. How do you balance expectations for the familiar with innovations of new material? Let's look at another pair of cards to show you what I mean. On the left is Nessian Game Warden from Journey into Nyx, and on the right is Tree Shaker Chimera from the new set. The first card is Magic's attempt at an ancient Greek Chimera. Is the second card in all earnestness the same thing? This is confused further because both illustrations are done by Vincent Pros. To me, the second card is primarily a reference to the first one, which itself was a reference to a beast from myth. It's a riff on a riff, a cover song of a cover song. Nilea and her second iteration tow a similar line. Both illustrations are virtually the same concept and composition, and both are done by Chris Ron. The second god feels like it's filling a void of expectation that players have for the return to this world, rather than standing alone as its own design, and it creates confusion between the two cards and gameplay in the process. Re-releasing this character with ever so slight changes suggests that going back to Theros without these gods just wouldn't be Theros. So the five monocolored gods were recommissioned, 
and the other 10 two-color gods appear across the set in names, flavor text, and card art. Once again, Beyond Death in this way is making a reference not to Ancient Greece, but to Theros, Magic's version of Ancient Greece. Maybe I'm being too picky or particular, but scanning the card image gallery of both sets simultaneously has me crossing my eyes. It's as if for every specific character design or event or visual gag from the first visit, there is a pseudo-equivalent present in the second visit. Archon of Sun's Grace reminds me of that one white rare from the pre-release, Celestial Archon, also by Matt Stewart. Brine Giant is essentially Benthic Giant, but out to terrorize during the day. Nyad of Hidden Coves sends me back to my study on the art of David Palumbo. Wavebreak Hippocamp is eerily familiar, and so is Hero of the Games. Bronze Hide Lion is too, but like its first iteration, it's also a reference to the Trials of Hercules. These strange doublings keep going, each one leaving me feeling like I've been here before. And then the sense of deja vu comes full circle with this card. In 2010, Clash of the Titans was remade. This time it had 10 times the budget, a more ambitious scope for its special effects, and leaned into all the Hollywood action movie tropes that it could muster. It's a generically bad movie, but it made some minor plot adjustments and streamlined the story. Much like every cult classic redo though, it doesn't do anything particularly new with the work. It feels more like a copy-paste cash grab than a piece of art with something to say. Cinemassacre's review said it best. I saw the remake recently, and of course I had no desire to see the remake. I mean, come on, Clash of the Titans without stop motion? But I gave it a chance. It's not often when a remake helps me to notice how something in the original could have been improved. But still, you can't beat the charm of the original. Like many other remakes of its kind, the 2010 version does pay a cheeky tribute to a character from the original film. It's the mechanized owl called Bubo that Athena gifts to Perseus to guide him on his journey. What's funny is... Also, gotta mention, Bubu makes a cameo in the remake, and it's the same Bubu! <laughs> Grey Merchant of Asphodel, like Bubu, is the same Grey Merchant of Asphodel. It's a full-on reprint with new card arts of a cult classic from Magic's past. Gary, as he is affectionately known by players, kind of encapsulates my qualms about Theros Beyond Death in one card. The element of pastiche present here is a mechanical one, and thus one that radiates throughout the game experience. To cast Gary in Theros Beyond Death Limited means to relive the events of the first go-around. But this is a farce. Anyone who has returned to a place knows that bittersweet nostalgia that comes from playing with memories. When you copy a copy, there's a tangible loss in quality in the resulting image. When we went to Theros the first time, we were presented an amalgamated world of Greek myth, high fantasy, and clever illusions wrapped in campy aesthetics. The return to Theros has been all of those things, but with one more axis involved which is the self-referential. Instead of a sequel, I get the feeling that Beyond Death was the remake. Its nods to the past are both the past of ancient Greece and the past of magic itself. The mechanics are the same with a couple new additions, the visuals are modified versions of previously used compositions and concepts, and the world is still cleanly divided by colors and elements and gods. In the basic land suite, we catch a glimpse of the Theros underworld. Its motif of chains and giant pillars is meant to evoke weight and imprisonment. Its saturated skies are both disquieting and serene. When I look at these images, I can't help but wish we were down here the entire time for this set. I think it would have been much riskier to abandon all expectations and elements of what made the first block successful and fully commit to this world, the one unknown, and so lightly explored before. In this way, I think Beyond Death would have been the sequel that is suggested by and lines up very nicely with that subtitle. I'd like to end with these full art basics of Nyx. I suppose these two illustrate my point. The giant mana symbols swirling in the night sky are not representations of basic lands, but of the abstract sign of those basic lands. This isn't a mountain at all, but a reference to magic's iconography that serves to symbolize a mountain. It's a pastiche of the game itself. It's the first time we've seen such self-awareness outside of an unset, for better or for worse, not to mention the affinities they have with the aesthetics of another trading card game. In Book 12 of the Odyssey, Odysseus recounts the troublesome journey he has just endured to navigate the dangerous waters surrounding the Sirens. He then is shipwrecked by a six-headed sea monster, marooned for a month on the Island of the Sun, then loses his entire crew to a storm that Zeus sends his way as punishment. From here, 
he must restart his journey, losing all progress made in the weeks prior. He then concludes this book. This episode, like all my episodes, is once again brought to you by the lovely people at Card Kingdom. Use cardkingdom.com studies to pick up some Theros Beyond Death cards or some OG basic lands. I recommend Stephen Belladin's Islands and Foil, of course. Thanks for watching. <laughs>